Hi, everyone, and welcome to week two, where we're going to talk about introduction to data analytics. All right, let's go. So welcome to Anley 500, or if you're watching this just for fun, welcome to statistics. And in this course, we're going to focus on the foundations of data analytics. So what is data analytics and what does that got to do with me? Research methodology and the R programming language. So you're going to learn a lot about statistics and research design in, in R and uh, a little bit about data analytics and the broader context of how we're learning statistics. Now, my background is social science, but we'll talk about business as well as the softer sciences. So the first question we have to ask ourselves, what is analytics? Like, why call it analytics? partially because that's the name of our program, but why call it analytics over statistics? And analytics can be defined in a lot of different ways, but let's focus on two different definitions. Possible definition number one. It's the utilization of data. So everybody likes data, especially now with big data and the focus on, um, on you know, crunching through the numbers. Information technologies like programming languages okay, and statistical analysis. And as a, a, a background with a, a strong research background and being a statistician, I'm really interested in the stats part. Okay. And we can do that through quantitative and qualitative methods. I teach both and mathematical or computer models to help us make the best decisions through those improved insights. So statistics and analytics kind of go hand in hand, but we have to remember that often people interpret statistics as the like traditional um, ANOVA's t-test hypothesis testing on real numbers, right? Where there's a whole side of analytics that you're missing when it comes to visualization, because a good visual is worth many words, more than a thousand, and also text analysis. So analytics kind of covers the broad field of using data to make informed decisions. Now here's another possible definition. And it's the processing, processing process of examining data to draw conclusions. That was what I'd argue a lot of people do about whatever information is contained. So gleaning from the data, what is it telling you? Can we build models that represent the data to help us predict the next piece? And this is improved or expanded through specialized software. So we're going to focus on R in this class, but there are many software tools that one can use like Tableau for visualization, uh, SPSS and SAS for statistics, Python, which kind of floats depending on who you're talking to and what Python's good best usages are for modeling purposes, right? And so there are a lot of different specialized softwares that we can focus on. And this course is going to look at R, especially because it's free. So what is the scope of analytics then, right? And so the focus of data analytics can be defined under three different scopes. Right? And that includes descriptive analytics, right? predictive analytics, and prescriptive analytics. Right? And I think if you kind of look at the names of these, they will become obvious what they are, but let's walk through each one. So descriptive analytics is the use of data to understand past and current performance. Now it doesn't have to be business, right? It could be looking at um, the uh, participants' performance in a research study, right? And making informed decisions. A lot of this has a sort of business focus by calling it analytics, but here I am the social scientist, so we'll get both sides. And so it's describing the current data to help us then make some informed decision. Okay, so it's descriptive. Okay. And we're asking ourselves what happened. Okay, so what, what happened in the data? What is there? What is the data telling me? Okay. So here's an example um, using some R code. Okay. And so we'll pull out this data set that is saved in the data sets library. Okay, this comes with base R. And specifically, we're going to load the sunspot months data. Okay. And so we're just going to look at trends in the number of sunspots. Okay. 
And that will help us understand if there is a pattern to these trends across time. So we're accessing this data by loading the library right, and then calling the data set. And there are a lot of data sets in the data sets library, hence the name. And this one is set as a time series design. Um, so it's a special type of vector that has each month's number of sunspots. Now I can look at the structure here to help me kind of solidify some of those R skills we talked about in our previous lectures, where I see that it's like, it's a special label, right? It's a vector of, of like one row of data, but it's specifically a time series vector. Right? And that can make it difficult to work with because uh, I think I mentioned in the last one that dates are always problematic, but we're just gonna kind of count, you know, treat this as con a continuous time because it's each month's data and just see if we can make a simple plot to describe what's happening in the data. Now the summary function, which spits out uh, different options based on what it is taking in, remember? So this is gonna give me the basic descriptives of that. So some months have no sunspots, some months have 253 sunspots, okay? and the average is 52. Okay? And these are just sort of the basic statistics one can get which we'll cover more in some of the next lectures on the difference, what does the third quartile exactly mean? Um, but, you know, I can understand min and max without a whole lot of extra background. So there's a wide range of variability in the data. So from that summary, I could probably tell you on average, I can make a prediction and that on average there's gonna be about 50, but there's a wide uh, spread in the data as well. Now we can visualize this. Now I'm gonna use ggplot. We have an entire lecture on ggplot alone. So it's okay if you don't really understand totally what's going on in here in this code just yet. Okay. And I can tell you that there is uh, almost never a day when I write a ggplot without Googling <laughs> because it is such a beautifully complex package. Um, and so it's, it's cool if you are like, I don't, there's a lot going on here. And so we're gonna visualize that data just to help us understand what a descriptive analytic might be. Okay. And so we'll cover how to make these more. So here's the plot. And what happens with ggplot is that you build these layers. Okay. And so we start with the first layer, which is what the, what the data is underneath. Okay. So I tell it, okay, we're gonna load this sunspot thing. And notice that I converted this sunspot thing from this special time series design to a data frame. So we talked at the end of the last R lecture about converting between types. So I coerced this into a data frame. And then I just added a time variable. So this would be the start of the time series to the end. And so you can just think about this being monthly across time. Now with the plot itself, I then added some layers. I added some dots, geom points. And then I added a Y label, number of sunspots, an X label, time. And I made it not ugly because the base ggplot background is ugly. <laughs> and so this, it's kind of like a basic intro to ggplot. It add, you add layers as you go. So you just add like one piece at a time. And so we told it, here's X and Y, add some dots, add some labels. And we'll go into the specifics of that more. So a little preview. But what can I gather from this plot? Well, it appears there will be quite a cyclical pattern to these when it goes up and down and up and down. And what we can start to do, if we um, had actually labeled these plots as like January, February, March, we could see if this is a yearly pattern or if it's a tri like every quarter or something, if there's some particular reason why we get this sort of cycle pattern. Okay, but that's a great descriptive statistic of visualizing the data. Now we might then use that descriptive statistics to make predictions. And I would say this, this is kind of where most statistical models fall is that they're trying to um, understand or classify the data or build a model that will then help for later prediction with, you know, the sort of statistics that you see in a research articles, what they're telling you if there are group differences is that they predict that those group differences would happen again. It's not always clear, but you know, for businesses, prediction seems really important, but researchers do this too. We just don't always call it predictive analytics, right? 
And so we're trying to predict the future by looking at some previous data or detect some new interesting patterns in the data and extrapolating that relationship to some future event. Okay. So people are trying to predict the stock market. That's hard because the stock market is what's called a stochastic process, meaning it goes up and down, up and down, up and down. Okay. Um, but let's say I'm just trying to predict voting patterns okay, that um, may be easy to do. Although Nate Silver would argue with me <laughs> based on historical trends. But if we just took it at its simplest, can we see if there are group differences between um, different states, for example, on voting? And if I find that there are group differences, this is the simplest test we can have, right? It's a t-test. Um, then what I'm saying is that I predict those group differences will probably hold later. Okay. And so we're asking what could happen? What, what would we predict happen given the data that we have? So on this next slide, I'm going to show you a simple linear regression. We'll get to this probably about midway through the semester. And um, regression at its heart is about prediction. <laughs> so this is a, a, an example of how I might build a simple prediction model. And by the end of this course, you will be able to do these types of models. Okay. So uh, the quant mod package is one of those add-ons that we talked about. So it allows us to grab stock data and it's um, useful for like a stock kind of analysis. Okay, and this helps us understand also some data structures here. So let's see what happens. I loaded the library because you remember they're not on when you start so you have to load them. You know I gave it some start and end dates okay, from today. Sys date means what time is it right now? So 1229. And I say, okay, grab Amazon's stock prices from you know, the start date to the end date. What it does is it gives us back this kind of like strange XTS object, but at its heart, it's a dimensional data frame. And so it pulls back this Amazon open. So where did it open that day? High, low, close, and a couple of others it kind of cuts off and then also has the stock price. So let's see what we can do with that. And then here we're going to predict. So we're going to say that the closing price is predicted by the high price, the low price, and the volume for that day. And I'm just going to predict the first part of the data. We're going to talk about slicing and subsetting, um, or indexing, sorry, and subsetting in the R lecture. So this is just part of what's available at the data. So I'll say, okay, let's see what happens. Can I predict that model? Well, this is gonna look like a bunch of, of gobbledygook to people who have not had a statistics course. But the short answer is, yeah, this model, um, given its statistics, appears to be predictive of the stock price. And what appears to be the most predictive is the high and low price for the day. <laughs> So I can predict the closing price if I know the high and the low price. During that day, obviously not, because you wouldn't know which is which, but um, it does appear to be predictive. So what do I do then? Well, then I could create some cool visualizations because descriptive statistics is an important part of predictive analytics. And we won't go into what all these tell me, but they tell me uh, a little bit more about how, why I should think about the model that I've built. So I can look at these kind of dot plots and think about improving my model or some of the assumptions behind the model, like exploring more on what I should um, care about in the model. Okay, and we'll cover a whole week on data screening for this ex express purpose. And then now I can make a prediction. So I want to predict the second half of the data set. So I've created a model from the first half, now I want to predict the likely second half. That's so what I'm doing here is predicting what the last Christmas week would have been this year, given my model. It should be pretty close because this model was pretty good. And we could compare it to the actual data and see how close we were. All right, from that I can look at the 
predictive model. And this just like shows you that over the last 50, 60 days, this uh, has been going up and down, kind of leveling out. So they had a high point and then they got a leveled out. So like Christmas, <laughs> right? And then it evens out. Right. So that's prediction. But what about prescription? Okay. So this is really where it becomes applied. So I identify the best alternative. So like, let's say I'm trying to um, do day trading, for example. I might see if I can figure out which days I should buy, which days I should sell. And so prescriptive analytics give you a prescription for what to do next. And, you know, as a person who does a lot of basic level stuff, I don't do a whole lot of this, but I work with a lot of applied researchers who, let's say, are trying to um, improve the lives of others. So I work with a lot of clinical psychologists and uh, especially a group that focuses on disaster mental health. So what happens after a tornado? What happens after a hurricane or a flood? What can we do to help people survive? Right? That's where prescription comes in. So they're saying, you know, given this um, focus from our research study, we think this is the best therapy or these are the best solutions or here are the things that we should target to improve the lives of others. Now, if your business, this makes a lot of sense. You want to maximize your bottom line, right? So you're trying to minimize costs and maximize gains. Um, but this is really a question of what should we do? So given these results, how should we pivot to, you know, meet our goals? And so there's a whole field that focuses on optimization okay, and optimization of parameters. I watched someone give a really fascinating talk one time about where... Um, um, ambulances should sit to best maximize their response times. And like, blew my mind. Like, I don't even know where to start on the math for that. <laughs> so there's a whole field that focuses on optimization of complex, um, complex designs. Like, for example, how Amazon delivers their packages. So what does that like really translate to and tell me to do, right? So analytics is the discovery, interpretation, and communication of what's in the data. Okay. We don't torture the data, although you could, and then, well, I'll show you how and why you shouldn't, but we're getting the data to tell us what's in it. Okay. And creating these summaries, these descriptions, these visualizations, creating predictive models, and then saying from that predictive model, here's what I think you should do, which is a prescription. And so I, um, I think this is a funny phrase, honestly, but analytics is a mindset. <laughs> Data analytics is a process, right? And so I think of this as like, you have to think like a researcher, right? So what, what could have gone wrong in this data? What is this data? What is the background of the data? You know, should I trust the data? Is it garbage in, garbage out? That kind of thing. And the statistics is the application of the math to that. So you still have to have that mindset of thinking about all the components and pieces that go into an analysis before you even hit the buttons. Because almost anyone can learn how to write and hit the buttons, but the interpretation is the, is the skill set we're gonna learn, along with some code. But interpretation is a lot harder. And you thought the code was gonna be the hard part this semester. Right? So conducting analytical research is, is a, a form of thinking and acting on the data. So what's the next question? Well, what is data analytics then? If I've kind of defined analytics, what is data analytics? This, to me is a fancy phrase for statistics, but you know, that is my background. And so it's the process of examining data sets in order to draw some conclusions about the information that it contains. And so if that's data analytics, how do we do that? Right. If I'm going to describe data analytics as a process of applying math, right? Um, and it doesn't always just be math, it can be visualization. So a process of examining, visualizing, describing, and drawing some conclusions. Like how do I, how do I do that? And then we get into data analysis. Okay. So data analytics is this very big, broad term. I feel this way when people talk about data science, um, you know, when someone tells me that they're a researcher, I'm like, okay, cool, but what do you do, right? 
And so that includes data analysis as is necessary subcomponent. And analytics defines the science behind analysis. And so I, to me, it really is about thinking about the whole picture, right? So there's this broad range of, of things that can impact an analysis and a good data an analyst is someone who can think about all of those pieces, especially to me, like uh, what, what the data is. Being suspicious of data, right? In the sense that um, if, if I'm not um, aware of the biases that are available in the data, my analysis will then also be biased. Okay, so an interesting story. I was listening to a podcast one time. Um, and if you're interested in this idea of bias, Kathy O'Neill, is who you should go and look up. Weapons of Math Destruction, it's really fascinating. And they were trying to solve um, a city problem, right? Potholes. Where are the potholes and can we go fill them in? And so they had this app that they put on, that they allowed city people to download. And um, it would, while you were driving, it would measure like, you know, the car bouncing up and down. And what they found when they analyzed the data was that there were only potholes in the rich neighborhoods because the people in the poorer city neighborhoods probably couldn't afford the data to run the app continuously while they were riding the bus or didn't even know about this app. And so the data was biased when it came in because it only came from certain sources. And so it took them a while to figure out like, no, this, <laughs> this isn't working. Like it's a great idea and there's nothing wrong with the data collection apparatus, but the source of the data was biased. And so that's what I mean by thinking about the like whole picture. So not only all the little statistical mathematical components, but this whole, like, what is this actually telling me? Okay. And so what are we going to do? Well, we're going to talk about exploratory data analysis. And there's a whole, there's a separate whole course on this in our program, which really just like aims to find these patterns and these relationships in the, the data kind of get it a little bit into not like traditional EDA, but this idea of visualizing, creating these visuals that, are, you know, explore the data. And then confirmatory data analysis, which is where we're going to apply some sort of statistical technique like an ANOVA, t-test, regression, um, factor analysis. And so these are the things that we're going to learn this semester. Okay. And we're really going to focus on hypothesis testing um, because that is sort of the base of a good statistics education, right? Is thinking about asking questions and finding ways to answer them. However, we have to think about the fact that there are several other types of analyses that one might do, and they're not actually incompatible with this EDA, CDA distinction. I would say that I don't often think about it this way in the sense that, um, I'm usually doing the like hypothesis testing, but as part of that, I might also do some exploratory analyses. Um, but these, the distinction is important because if we look at the current trends in um, science, there's a big focus on rep replication, reproducibility. Can we do our research projects actually hold <laughs> over and over and over again, right? And so um, that distinction implies in the exploratory part that you're trying to figure out what's in the data. And then later you do it again to confirm that what you found the first time holds the second time. But another kind of unfair split as somebody who does both of these is this distinction between qualitative and quantitative data analysis. And there's this sort of weird hierarchy but people think that quantitative data analysis is the answer. <laughs> And so all that distinction is, is that quantitative data analysis is something that's already a number, right? So um, those end of year evaluations that you get where you rate your teacher, those are numbers, right? You strongly agree, you strongly disagree, but people put them as one, two, three, four. Uh, time is a number, stock market is a number, weight, height, uh, percent, correct. These are all naturally numbers. And so these quantifiable, variables can be measured in their differences statistically. What do you do if you have data that isn't already a number? Right? Two whole courses on this in our program, <laughs> some taught by yours truly, but it's more, I jokingly talk about these classes being interpretive dance because 
we have to think about like if I want to analyze text, especially, or an image or audio and video, which in their forms may also be text, um, how what do I do differently? Because those are not numbers. We can convert them into numbers and then apply some statistics on them. But there's a lot of things like topics analysis that people are really interested in. So if I have a bunch of reviews on a specific product, do people like it or not? Well, I can look at the ratings, but then I have to remember that those are biased because people buy product reviews. And so maybe I can look at the text and figure out the real product reviews, right? This is a problem that Amazon has. Uh, and then from those real product reviews, do people like it or not? Right? And so that's more of a qualitative question. And so I think it's kind of an unfair split because it somehow implies that these one is better than the other, but um, qualitative questions often lead to numeric quantitative analyses. You just gotta figure out how to convert it first. And so that I think is where I had planned, I wrote it down, I had planned to stop. So we'll stop here for this first half part of the video so that these don't get way too long. And then in the second section, we'll move on to this sort of the research process sets of questions. So head on over to that video.